Hi, I'm Jared Cooper. Welcome to Days of Wonder. We're talking about how to live a strong life in God at the moment. You know, having a dream is one thing. Having a prophecy or a hope is one thing. Fulfilling it is a whole other matter. Have you noticed it? Endurance is really important. Perseverance is really important to see the will of God come about in your life. And I don't know about you, I want to live a strong life. I think for some weakness is perhaps a fashionable way to get out of the pressure of change. But the reality is the gospel is all about the weak saying, I'm strong. You know the scripture. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Let's be growing in the things of God so the gospel works. And I may start weak. Let's be honest. We all start weak. Let's take consolation from that. We're all weak. But the whole point of the gospel is we're supposed to become strong. And the last time we were together, I spoke about the first law of strength. And when I use the word law, I, it's like the law of gravity, just the ways that God has made the world to work. The first law of strength is the law of foundation. You've got to have a strong foundation. If you've got a crooked foundation, you can only ever build a crooked house. So the hidden things, the, the under the floor things need to be sorted in our lives so that we get a strong basis to live from. It's time that our generation stops some of those generational difficulties that have come up again and again. Things like debt and unemployment and divorce. We can be the generation that stop it and lead to new patterns in our families taking place. You can be the strong generation if you get your foundation right with God. The other thing we looked at was the law of activity. Actually, do you realize that your passions follow what you do, not the other way around? We often think, I've got a passion, therefore I do. Actually, that's quite a weak way to live because you are, at the, at the, you, are, you are held captive by what you feel. The reality is, it's a better way to live to choose what the right thing to do is. Because then the law of activity proves this. If I do the right thing, my passions will follow. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Our treasure is not just our money, it's also our time, our effort, our care. And so if we choose, that's where I'm going to put my things. Forget what I'm feeling. I'm going to put my heart where it should be. Guess what? All those feelings follow that. And you begin to realize how it is to live strong. Strong people do the right thing and their feelings follow. Weak people have their feelings lead their lives. And so I want to carry on with some other foundations in life. Um, now, this next one isn't very fashionable right now, but I'm going to do it anyway, because it's never going to go out of fashion in God's kingdom. It's the law of repentance. Repentance is a powerful thing. I use it every single day. Every single day I say, oh, God, I'm sorry. I don't want to live that way. I want to live this way. We can't just come along going, well, I'm good. God has to accept me. God has to love me. No, it's quite clear all of humanity is a little bit broken and we need a savior. And repentance is the way, quite simply, that we turn and we change our minds and we say, I'm not going to live that way. I'm going to live God's way. Something powerful happens when we use repentance to bring our lives back in line with God. Now, the reality is if we don't, scary stuff can happen. Listen to this scripture. I love this. It says, it's Matthew 12 and verse 35. It says, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. And um, there in this verse, it's saying, what's in you is going to come out. Good inside, good's going to come out. Evil inside, evil's going to come out. Now, the reality of this scripture, when it says brings forth, it has a, a violent kind of feel to it in the original language. In other words, stuff's going to come out of you violently when you least expect it. There was a pastor who had one of his congregation who really did not like him at all. She would complain. Uh, she, would, she would grumble. She would write letters and emails to him. She would gossip about him. She would make fun of his bald patch and his preaches. And over time, he slowly started to really hate this woman. He, he just was growing. It started off as, oh, she's an irritant. But then it grew and grew and grew until he was really quite deep inside, bitter about this woman. And so she began to occupy a lot of his thinking. He was driving along in his car one day, going around a slow curve. And as he went round the curve, he saw this woman driving towards him in her car. She wound down the window and she shouted out of her window, pig, pig. 
and he wound down his window now and all of the hatred inside of him was now going to come out like a geezer. He shouted, cow, you cow. And he drove around the corner into the pig. <laughs> OK, it was a joke. Did you get the joke? She was warning him about a pig and he thought he was up, she was having a go at him. So out comes all of this stuff that's stored out. You know, what's inside you is going to one day violently come out. Repentance is how we keep turning back to God and saying, God, I want what is inside me to be a treasure, to be pure. I don't want bitterness to build up in my heart. I forgive the miserable woman. I forgive the miserable woman. Sometimes you've got to forgive by faith. Do you know what that means? I have another way of putting it. You forgive through gritted teeth. I forgive because it's the right thing to do. I forgive because I refuse to be captive to bitterness. I forgive because bitterness is like a poison that's going to destroy me. So I'm going to keep my heart right and clear and pure. Listen to these Bible verses. Uh, Acts 3 verse 19 says, Repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Repentance is a refreshing thing. When we turn to God and say, God, help me with this area that I'm struggling. I don't care. Friend, if you have to repent 30 times a day for the same thing, keep repenting. Keep repenting, keep turning back to God, keep turning back for help. I guarantee you, if you keep turning back to God and focus your faith on him and his love for you, his capacity to forgive you, but also this, his capacity to mature you and bring you through. This is what I've found, that slowly sin falls away like autumn leaves. There's things that distressed us so much eventually seem to disappear as we keep coming back to rely on the power of God. We can't sit there going, well, I'm fine. You know, part of the current generation problem is perhaps a little bit that people don't feel guilty. But listen, Proverbs 30 verse 12 says this. There is a class of people who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their own filth. The reality is even our righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. Every single one of us needs a saviour. Repentance, my friend, will keep you strong, not make you weak. That humility of saying, I'm a little bit broken. I'm a little bit dysfunctional. I need a saviour. And we turn our hearts back to God again and again. Keeps us clean, keeps us pure, and stops the poison of sin from getting into our lives. Listen to this passage from John Henry Jowett's The Grace Awakening. It says this, sin is a blasting presence and every fine power shrinks and withers in its destructive heat. Every spiritual delicacy succumbs to its malignant touch. Sin impairs the sight and works towards blindness. Sin numbs the hearing and makes men deaf. Sin perverts the taste, causing men to confound the sweet with the bitter and the bitter with the sweet. Sin hardens the touch and eventually renders a man past feeling. If we stop staying soft before God and our hearts become calloused, we won't even know it, but we're far from God. We may be paying lip service in church, we may be singing the songs, but repentance draws us close to God. Say, God, I humble myself before you. Humility is one of the laws of strength. I'm not going to talk about this today, but humility draws God into our world. The Bible says that he resists the proud. Literally, the word means he fights against the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I don't know what, I don't know about you. I do not want God fighting against me. I want his favor to touch my life. So in the humility of repentance, there's great joy, there's great presence, there's great power. Repentance is a law. I love this phrase, embarrass sin before it embarrasses you. Right? Embarrass sin before it embarrasses you. Get it out of your life. Have a quick spit reaction. You know, if you've got a fly in your mouth, you wouldn't chew it around and think, hmm, good bit of protein. No, you get a fly in your mouth, you spit straight away. This is how Christians should live. If you get sin in your life, spit, get it out. Get it out as quick as you can. Embarrass sin before it embarrasses you. Get rid of that thing. A preacher was flying on, a, on an aeroplane flight and the woman sat next to him who he didn't know made a bit of a pass at him in the plane. Well, he stood up in front of everybody and he pointed at the woman and said, harlot of Babylon, you're a harlot of Babylon. What was he doing? He was embarrassing sin before it embarrassed him. 
He refused to be caught in the tangles of sin. He was going to be absolutely powerfully positive. I'm not going near that stuff. He used his spit reaction. Puh, I don't want that sin in my life. Repentance is one of the laws of strength. Stay soft. If you need to repent a hundred times a day, then do so. But keep coming back to God and saying, God, help me with this thing until I overcome. Embarrass sin before it embarrasses you. Part of the law of repentance. Another powerful one, the law of mission. Do you know that you were made for an adventure? Church is not meant to be some cosy club where we sit and chat about whether we like the colour of the carpets, whether the aircon is right or the seats are comfortable. Jesus, at the end of two of the Gospels, says, go into all the world, preach. He, he left us a commission, a co-mission. Go and go out on a mission, go out on an adventure, go out on a quest and do incredible things for me and with me. We were left with a sense that we're supposed to be on something of a quest to go and change the world around about us. And I can tell you today, my friend, you work best when you're on a mission, when you're going, when you're pioneering. Now you might say, I'm, I'm, too, I'm too ill, I'm too weak, I'm, I'm unable, I can't go in any way, shape or form. I love this story by Martin Buber, the Jewish philosopher. He says this, my grandfather was lame. And once they asked him to tell a story about his teacher and he related how his master used to hop and dance while he prayed. And my grandfather rose as he spoke and was so swept away by his story that he himself began to hop and dance around to show how his master had done. From that moment, he was cured of his lameness. He got so taken up in the story, he forgot that he was ill and suddenly healing came forth. Sometimes we say we're too weak, we're too sinful, too unable, we're not spiritual enough, we're too ill. But God actually has made mission to transform us. Something happens as you go, you get healed along the way. Don't think I'll wait till I'm perfect, then I'll do God's will. No, 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 no. Start to do God's will now, any way you can. Start to do God's will. And you're going to find healing breaks out like the dawn in your life. It's a law of strength, the law of mission. We are on this world to change it. And you might not be able to go far. I, I understand that because of the situation you're in. But you can go with an email. You can, you can maybe write a card. You, can, you, can go. you might not be able to go to the next country, but you can go perhaps to the next street. Or perhaps just pick up the phone and just begin to use care for others. Because you know what? It changes something in you. As you begin to sow, you're going to reap something from heaven. As you begin to go, you're going to receive some strength from heaven. Something happens as we go. It's a law of strength. You look best on a mission. Every day that you wake up, go on a mission. A revivalist was brought to London to a, a grand and great service and the man was quite an old man and he'd experienced revival up in the Scottish islands. Uh, and a friend of mine was interviewing this great old revivalist and really it was probably the last time that he would be in a big event in somewhere like London. And so my friend said, if you were to leave one piece of advice about revival and about Christianity for the generation around you in this great hall right now, what would you say is the most important thing? And you might think that a great revivalist would say fire or glory or revival or pray, you know, something really spiritual like that. And this revivalist stopped for a moment to think, what's the one thing I could leave a generation to understand? And the revivalist took the microphone and he just said the word, others. Then he repeated it, others, others 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 think of others go for others help others support others i mean revival can be summed up in a word others let's go reach the others because something happens in us maybe the revival we long for will never come until we stop obsessing about ourselves and start living for others and to care for others and to help others find christ you at your best will be someone who is living for others. You will find the greatest fulfillment within you when you stop thinking about yourself and start to live for others. It's one of the laws of living strong. Let me give you another one. 
the law of team. You were made for community. I love this story. There's a Spanish story of a father and a son who had become estranged. The son ran away and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last de desperate effort to find him, the father put an advert in a Madrid newspaper. The advert read, Dear Paco, it's a common Spanish name, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On the Saturday in question, 800 Pacos turned up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. Oh boy. We live in an incredibly lonely world. Never have we been more connected by social media and media and technology, but actually we live in a desperately lonely world. You were made for team. Through the story of creation, you find again and again, God looked and saw that it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. Do you remember the first not good in the Bible? <laughs> Man on his own. And every wife said, yep, you're absolutely right. There'll be socks everywhere. <laughs> Man on his own is not a good story. We were made for community. Something happens when we come together. I remember one time in my life feeling a little bit lonely, a little bit down, wanting to grow more in God. And I'm, I'm sat in a little church service. And while the preacher's preaching, my mind zones out to somewhere else. And God interrupts me. And he says these words to me. He says, your Jonathan is coming very soon. Now, I knew exactly what he meant because I've been studying the life of David and Jonathan, these two great friends who did great things together. And God turned and said to me, your Jonathan is coming soon. I knew a support, a help, a connection was coming very soon that would help me. Well, that was a Tuesday night. On the Wednesday, I'm walking down a corridor of the Bible school where I worked. And a man whose name wasn't Jonathan walked up to me and said, God's told me to be your Jonathan. Well, we had amazing adventures together. He was a great man of God. We went and we, we, we prophesied over royalty together. We helped equip medical centers in South Africa together. We had adventures. We were chased by men with guns in Zimbabwe. We had incredible time together. I remember this one little meeting where we were praying for a little group of people and legs were growing before our eyes as Jesus was healing people. We had incredible adventures, all because God said, right, you and you, I want to put you together and Boy, that man downloaded adventures into my heart. And I'm so grateful for that man. Why? Because something comes from others. There's a grace that's got to come into your life from other people. Do you realize over 90% of your prayers are going to be answered through someone? Have you noticed that? And so if you're someone that has a problem with people and others and church community and authority. You've got a problem, my friend. You're going to end up living in drought because most of your prayers will be answered through people. And as we get into connection with people, there's a grace that can flow into our lives. People are like a sacrament. Relationships are a sacrament. That means they're a means of receiving grace into my life. Have you ever been down, despondent, guilty, lost, and you sit down with a friend or a cup of coffee or a little meal and you, you just talk and you walk away feeling stronger. Let me tell you what's happened. Grace came into your life because, because of others. There's something about others that bring the grace of God into our lives. The law of team. Let me end with this one. One last powerful law, the law of baptism. God has made Christianity to work by full immersion. <laughs> Hobby Christianity won't do. Dabbling around the edges won't do. Sitting on the, face waiting, uh, on the fence waiting to see what will happen won't do. Christianity is a Christianity is a religion of baptism, a religion of absolute full immersion in the things of God. I don't want to encourage you, get immersed in what God's called you to do. You know, when Jesus was turning to his disciples and said, take up your cross, follow me. It wasn't a metaphorical cross. Those guys literally were dying for the gospel when their life carried on uh, as they went out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this list. 
Andrew died on a cross. Simon was crucified. Bartholomew was skinned alive. James, son of Zebedee, was beheaded. The other James was beaten to death. Thomas was run through with a lance. Matthias was stoned and beheaded. Matthew was killed with a sword. Peter crucified upside down. Thaddeus shot with an arrow. Philip was hanged. These guys literally died for the gospel. They were immersed. The gospel only works when you immerse and you say, life or death, I'm going for it in God. I love short-term missions. I love heading to lovely places and sharing the gospel with people and trading people and stuff like that. But you know, there was a time that before you'd go on missions, some people would have every medical procedure that might happen. You like teeth out and, and stuff like that and get their tonsils out and get the, and before they went on mission, some of them even had their, 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 their burial chambers made. They had their coffins made and took it with them because they knew I'm going out on mission. I'm never coming back. That's commitment. The kingdom of God works by full immersion when we throw ourselves into it. When I was a little boy, um, about seven years old, my dad had a good job. We were in a lovely church in South Wales and God called my family to the mission field. And I, I vividly remember, it turned out that it was a wonderful experience in the end. But my first memory of this adventure was my mum coming to me with a pillowcase and she said, you've got to sell all your toys. We're following God on mission. And you can keep whatever toys you can put in this pillowcase. And she handed it me, like, right. So I filled it with Lego and action men and stuff like that. And I remember the day when we opened the doors of our house, we'd put price tickets on all of our furniture and everything we had in the home. We opened the doors to all the neighbors and we just let them come in and just buy everything. And I vividly remember the day we put everything we owned into a Citroen 2CV, a little bubble car. Everything we owned was now there in that little car. And we drove off homeless and jobless on the adventure of a lifetime with God. And what I remember vividly of that time was not joy, not fun. I remember selling my toys. I remember seeing my brother's teddy bear stuffed onto the front of a dust cart as it went off. I remember my mum sobbing as we drove, leaving our home and everything we'd known up to that time behind. She cried. I remember it wasn't nice tears. It was loud, guttural sobs as we left. That was my first memory of following God. It demanded total immersion. But you know the result? We were so blessed as a family. So blessed by God in ministry. So blessed by God with each other in family. Even my parents who had given up so much. So blessed financially by God. You see, when you immerse yourself into the things of the kingdom, you're never going to be left at a loss before God. He's never going to be indebted to you. If you pour out everything to God, guess what? He will pour out everything of himself to you. And God's got a lot more to give. Our lives have been so blessed because of a moment of baptism. That's what baptism is when we're baptized in water. We're symbolizing a death and a resurrection to a new life. The thing is, we might do it once in water, but let me tell you, There'll be time and time again when God says, I need you to immerse into this so that I can bring you to a place of blessing in life. Maybe today you're feeling the tug of God to immerse into something. It might be something as simple as commit yourself to this church or do this ministry or a certain career or some place of investment or give finances over here. Some personal cost in your life and God is saying, I want you to give out of your own self into this. Let me tell you what God is doing in these moments. He's lining you up for favor and blessing and strength. Do not shy from the baptisms of heaven. When we immerse ourselves in the things of God, let me tell you, favor breaks out in our lives. It's wrong to think, let me dabble on the edges of Christianity and see how it works. Let me have a hobby Christianity. I'll sing on a Sunday, but it really doesn't affect my Monday. Let me tell you something, it simply will not work. The power of the kingdom comes only to those who are immersed completely in the things of God. We always tell people a bit of a joke at our church when we're doing water baptisms. If you're particularly naughty, we'll hold you under for longer till the bubbles stop. Then we'll bring you up. <laughs> I think sometimes God says to us, I know you've been immersed before but I want to immerse you even deeper in the things of God. I want to encourage you to trust God. There are times when he's asking of things from us. It's never to harm us. He has no plans in his heart or his mind to harm you, not a single one. If you follow God faithfully, you will find the baptism you go through 
will be a thing of blessing and strength. So let me tell you, let me finish off by saying this. God wants to build strength in your life. He is so committed to you, not staying weak as we all start, but becoming strong by his power. But he puts through the Bible many, many ways that you can become strong in him. And if you enlist the ways of heaven and draw them into your world, if you build a strong foundation, if you run with the law of activity, if you get into team connected, don't be a pot plant, be planted in the house of God. Don't be someone that can move every time you get left off a rotor or a steward doesn't smile at you. No, no, no. Be planted in the house of God. Great grace will come from that. Use the law of repentance. Stay soft hearted before God and you will draw the strength of God into your world. Use the laws of heaven. They're all over the scriptures. It's a book of decisions. Every decision you want to make in life, you'll find a secret of wisdom here. And when you do, you're going to live a strong life all the days of your life.